Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Ruth Ezel. A lot of money has gone missing at local colleges and universities lately. A former administrator at Washington University was indicted for allegedly embezzling $300,000. A former University of Missouri employee admitted to stealing $781,000. And just a few weeks ago, an employee of St. Louis Community College was accused of embezzling $5.4 million. Another recent case involving a former academic administrator at Webster University got the Riverfront Times' Doyle Murphy asking a question that's at the heart of the justice system every day. That is, what constitutes just punishment? Doyle's latest feature for the RFT digs into this question and many more. He juxtaposes Deborah Pierce's sentence, which involved having to pay back the $375,000 she stole from Webster and writing in a journal for 60 days with the sentences handed down in other specific crime cases in the region, which often involve prison time. Doyle Murphy, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Um, First, what piqued your interest specifically about the Deborah Pierce case, the former Webster administrator? I mean, you sit in enough courtrooms and you watch enough of these sentencings and uh, and, or you just hear about the uh, the different punishments that come out. And this one, I mean, for that amount of money for a crime that was a, you know, one that you're, you have to take some steps to do, like you have to intend to do this. you know, to then then get kind of basically like a homework assignment and paying the money back, which is no small amount of money, obviously. Um, it just those are the, those are the kind of cases that stand out, I guess, when you kind of see this conveyor belt of of sentences coming through. So the way your article is structured, you go, you take a deep dive into Deborah Pierce, and then you have a series of capsules of, of several other cases, what the people did, how they got sentenced, how old they are. I'm just wondering why you took that approach to the article. Actually, the original idea is that we would just look at these capsules. We would just present just a lot of different cases for people to look at and see, you know, this case was handled this way, this case was handled that way, because so much just kind of hinges on where this case gets picked up, who's looking at it that day, maybe kind of prevailing attitudes at the time. And it, those kind of those kind of variables can really make, you know, a difference in years in people's lives or, you know, can really send them off on one direction or another. So I think it's, it's just always interesting to, to see, like, this, this, like, larger question of that we've been, like, grappling with for, I mean, basically forever <laughs> of, like, what do you do when somebody breaks your rules? What do you, what's punishment then? How do you, uh, how do you make this right? Well, of course, in August, um, former county executive, St. Louis County Executive Steve Stanger is going to be sentenced. So this topic is on a lot of people's minds right now. Um, Any similarities that you notice between the Stanger case, even though he hasn't received that official sentence yet, Mm -hmm. see any similarities between his case and Deborah Pierce's case and the way they've been handled? Well, it's going to be interesting. I mean, his was such like a kind of a whirlwind in terms of, you know, he gets indicted on Monday and pleads guilty on Friday. Um, but, I mean, you're looking at white-collar crime um, and people that, like, don't, you know, they're not typically what you think of as, like, oh, this person's, a, you know, a dangerous person or this person's going to be, um, I guess, for, for whatever it's worth, like, you don't think of it as your typical criminal because, They've lived this life where they haven't, you know, for years, for decades, they've not been convicted of any crimes, and not there any pattern of it. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait, they were committing large crimes. <laughs> they were, you know, they were uh, stealing all this money right under people's noses. Um, but, you know, when it comes to sentencing, Deborah Pierce had tons of people who were willing to speak out for her and to write these, you know, glowing letters for her and, you know, she, you could make kind of a um, sympathetic case for her. She's taking care of her mother who's been 
been sick and everything. So the, yeah, but she was probably doing it with school money too. Possibly. Seems like possibly, yeah. Um, so I mean, but you can do that kind of in any case. So it, you you look at something like this and um, and somebody says, oh, you know, she made a mistake or something. And it's like, no, it's not like it someone wasn't that was spontaneous like a spontaneous mistake. No, it's not <laughs> someone that's like walking through and sees like an opportunity to like smash a car window or something and and take a lot of money or a purse or something like that. Somebody that has, you know, that did set up a fake, set up a bank account that nobody knew about and like diverted this money over years. I mean, Stanger arguably took even like many more steps to uh, make this happen. Um, was in a, you know, a higher position of trust probably than Deborah Pierce um, and is facing, you know, I think the guidelines are work out to about three to five years for him. So, It'll be really interesting to see how uh, how they handle his his uh, sentence. Yeah, a lot of eyes will be on that one. Now, you write in your article too about a lot of younger offenders who almost always get sent to prison for, as you say, some things that are just done spontaneously. And you and you have a quote: uh, "Often those bad decisions are made by men so young, their brains are still developing." end quote. And when you think about that, they go to jail, their brains are still developing, and they could conceivably come out worse than when they went in. And, and how has society benefited from that? Right. I mean, I don't think you want prison exactly to be your training ground for a lot of young people. I mean, it's there. there has been progress on rehabilitation programs, if there's maybe some more options available here and there. But overall, I mean, I don't think anybody that looks at at the criminal justice system seriously thinks that, like, this is a good place for people to learn and develop habits and grow. Um, you know, it's, it's a bad place. Looking at those capsules, it did, one thing that did strike me, although you can't draw exact parallels to any of them, who you know and what lawyers you can get a hold of do seem to play a role. I mean, it seems like the ability to use your connections and get like high profile attorneys like the ones that Steve Stanger had represent them makes a difference. Right. I mean, it's one thing you, you know, I was at uh, Sheila Sweeney, um, her plea last week. I guess it was last week. Um, and you know, she comes in with four attorneys. She's another person that was charged in the in Stinger's pay-to-play uh, corruption scandal. Um, you know, you don't see, you know, a 20-year-old that's charged in a robbery or something. You don't see them come in with four attorneys or, you know, that, that have been working on their case, you know, they around the clock. They have a public defender. Right, you know. Yeah. And there are some very good attorneys that come out of, you know, the public defender's office. But, you know, the caseload is... You know, exorbitant. That's you. You just can't give the amount of time that you would that a private attorney can in a lot of cases. Has this prompted conversations um, for you with people in the system, with prosecutors, with judges? What kind of feedback? I mean, I'm, have you gotten just talking about the way the system is set up? It's kind of a conversation that I've had over the years for a long time with people about how you make these decisions, how, you know, a lot of power is with prosecutors in what they're going to recommend. Sometimes those recommendations are in concert with the uh, you know, defense attorneys that they've worked out some kind of agreement. Sometimes they come on at wildly different uh, ends of the scale. Um, but it, I, I think judges do listen to a lot of those. Not a, you know, judges have discretion uh, in cases where there's not set minimums and stuff. But, um, but I think there, there are a lot of these different, uh, different players who can really influence what, uh, you know, what happens to someone. And they've got to run through a whole lot of scenarios, or you would hope that they're, they're running through a lot of factors and weighing these out seriously um, each time that they're in that position to, to, uh, to uh, really affect someone's life. Of those capsules that you wrote down, are there one or two that really jumped out at you? 
Some of them there are, are cases that I've that I followed specifically. That you know, um, like Ray Hernandez, uh, it's, he ends up with two life sentences, which that was once he uh, once he was found guilty, that was and, done. And he what was were those he uh, two murder. He was it was a double homicide. Um, and I had written extensively about that case, um, and it's it's not. I guess it's not so much the sentence that he received. I mean, but it was. In, it's interesting to go to a go to a case where you know, that that's already set. That you know, the, all the action happens in the uh, in the conviction, and once that's done, then it's like you know, I, I went to the uh, the sentencing, but it was pretty much pro forma at that point. Well, there was one I particularly wanted to hear the backstory about a young lady. She was 19, I think, at the time, and somehow she was uh, the main suspect with a stolen car. She crossed state lines uh, from Illinois to Missouri and got picked up. And so I'm looking at this sentence. It was fairly light. And I couldn't help but wonder if this young white female had been a black male, would the sentence have been the same? Yeah, I mean, it's a fair question in a lot of these. I mean, because, you know, it's no real surprise that that if you look at numbers, like a, a young black male typically does far worse in our criminal justice system than, say, like a young female. Um, and even in, a, in Deborah Pierce's case, her attorney, part of his argument was that 40% of uh, women who are convicted of fraud, a similar crime, don't do any prison time, which is it's an interesting distinction, right? It is interesting. You know, like why should it matter? Why, that... why should the gender matter? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to thank Doyle Murphy of the Riverfront Times for joining us. We appreciate your time, and I would be interested to see some follow-up stories, too. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at ChooseWood.com.